actually. This is at the Hagley Institute. And a few of you have heard me, me discuss this engine in the past. Um, this engine was actually started its life out as in a, with a private collector in Philadelphia. It was given to the Franklin Institute in the 60s, and the Franklin Institute uh, from then gave it to the, uh, the Hagley Museum down, down in Wilmington. When they had it, they just kept it in storage for years. And then the, the, I think the New Jersey Transportation Authority, whatever, wanted to put it in a, in a display they had down there. And they contacted Hagley if they could put an old engine. And I said, sure. So the first thing Hagley did was take uh, a couple of uh, curators or whatever. And they went through and very carefully analyzed all the paint, the pigments, what, what the engine was, every little surface and detail on it. And Documented all this, wrote this huge thesis paper on it, put it in the sandblast booth and blasted all the paint off it. They had everything documented. They felt they did a good job. Then they painted it with zinc chromate paint, rolled on some black enamel, took it out of the shop, drove it to the, the truck where it was going to go to New Jersey, dropped it on the bed, business side of the engine, and smashed the governor off the engine. So. And the reason I'm kind of, I kind of, uh, it's kind of an interesting story because. It took me a long time to get permission to see this because it's not in public display, it's in storage. When I finally was able to see the engine, they treated it like gold and I, I couldn't touch it unless I was wearing uh, latex gloves and I had to have uh, pretty much supervision and everything. What are you doing? You already destroyed the engine. I can't hurt it with my hands. So. <laughs> it does exist. I tried to get it here. Uh, but again, in the United States, for the, for the benefit of the people that, that, that aren't from here, it's, it's not as easy to get things from one museum to another and there's a lot of insurance things. We weren't able to, but we're very happy with all the private engines we were able to, to bring here. But that is the only uh, known one horsepower or half horsepower, depending on how you look at it, engine made. Here's a, an interesting engraving of a, of, of a 15 or a 25 horse. They look very similar engine. And they were both, uh, both cylinders were of a side crank design with a belt in the middle. A lot of design issues on this thing that I, I think really led to its early demise, but they didn't make a few of them. And there's, uh, there are some documented, uh, some paper that shows where some of these were actually installed. And I have a factory photo I'll show you later with uh, a couple of these in, in, uh, being built. And again, twin cylinders incorporated mirrored side crank cylinders. Um, they used a newer slide valve system that was used on the, on the 10 horsepower engine. So they did, that was already designed so they could already incorporate that on here without anything major. There was a single dog bone on it for both cylinders, and the dog bone from the center side shaft drove a shuttle, and the <laughs> shuttle was, was hard bolted to uh, left and right slide valves. Uh, two and a half horsepower inverted engine was, was introduced in 1886. Here's an advertisement from the, the American uh, stationery. And that was about $290, which is still a lot of money. But this design was nice because it, it was a, a simple engine. They got rid of the, the cross-head system that was expensive to machine. The engine was a lot lighter. It didn't take as, up as much space on the floor. And uh, basically, you had the same horsepower for, for uh, a third of the cost. Uh, there's one of these uh, also in the, in the Susan building here that you can see. And that's a picture of the engine. And I hope they have that running tomorrow. Uh, improved, what they call an improved design, uh, came out in, around 1888, and we've Wait, got... Can I inter interrupt you there and ask what was the lettering on that five one, the previous one there? I was wondering that too. Okay, good question. Let me see if I go back here. Good question. Now, uh, my belief on that, from what I've seen from a lot of these early engines, the, they painted shop information on the, on the engine and Schleicher did a lot. I mean, they would put sometimes sizes on it. They put notes on it. The 10 horse I had in my shop for a while, the slide belt was down there. They had information written on the flyover rim that it was in special pumping service and all this. So I think as, as it was in the shop and they were working on it, they'd identify something key. Maybe this is a special customer or whatever or a special application. So as the engine was passing through the shop, they could see what it was. That got painted over. But over the years, as the, uh, the, the top coat of paint wore off, this lead-based stenciling ink they used stuck quite well, so a lot of that remains. A lot of the, the American uh, auto engines you'll see, which came out of the same factory, on the back of the engine you can see a serial number that's stenciled on the, uh, the back end of the, of the crankcase. So that was uh, just an ID they used for assembly in the, in the factory. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the, the newer engines, yeah, it's, it's 
still a slide valve. They used the slide valve system that was on the, uh, the, the, the uh, very similar system that was used on the, on the 10 horsepower engines. They went with the spur and bevel gear design and got rid of the, the helical gears. And they removed the cross legs, so the engine was significantly shorter, less iron in it, less parts of the machine. They could make more profit. And the competition was starting to get quite significant back in, uh, in 1988 for a lot of other companies. Uh, Ottawa lost his patent, and they really needed to, to be competitive. So this was a way to, to, to try to keep up with it. And again, less costly to build. And the design for it was, was basically their own design. They, they pretty much were independent at that time from many of the, uh, the, the core German engineering uh, efforts. And this is all this is what I said here. So. This is a picture of any horsepower improved uh, Schleicher shim that we've got here in the, in the field today in a trailer right outside the half creek building. It's a wonderful original example. Around 3,300 total slide valve engines were produced. Uh, production of the slide valve design was entirely replaced by poppet valve around 1891. And the slide valve engines ranged from 1 until 40 horsepower. We've, uh, if you look at the engraving in the Susan building in the back wall of the, of the Centennial Exposition, or the, the Columbian Exposition in Chicago of 1893, you'll see that there's a, uh, a very large slide valve engine the Schleicher exhibit with a vertical government. That's what we believe was a 40 horsepower engine. That was the largest size they made, and that was right at the very end of the, of the slide valve era from, <coughs> from Schleicher. Only 10 Schleicher slide valves exist today, and the Auto Gas Engine Works name was introduced around, around 1887. And just about done. Just got a couple uh, early Schleicher Schum photos I put up here. Some of you have seen them, maybe, maybe some of them are new to you. But uh, give me a second. Computer's being slow. All right, this is a photograph from uh, inside the factory. It's just shown in one of the early catalogs, and uh, just really brief on the, on the front side here, you can see some seven horse engines, and about the, the, the fourth engine back, fifth engine back on the right side, you can see the, a couple double cylinder engines. You had 15 or, or 25 horsepower engine. And at the very back of the photograph, uh, hanging from the crane is a 15 horsepower twin cylinder crankcase. So you can see the assembly area was fairly small, and they had uh, all the engines being built simultaneously, or possibly they just jammed everything in one shop for the photograph, too. So it's, we don't know, but that's the same photograph for the same assembly area is used in, uh, in a couple different Schleicher or Otto catalogs uh, in the same building. But also, I put this in the book, and you, you can look at it. There's a, uh, on the right side, there are a bunch of vices, and you can see a special wood block that fit slide valve assembly that the assembler would use to, to hold the slide valve would scrape the engine. This is kind of confusing, but what you're looking at is, uh, this, this is one, one half of a stereo view uh, card from the Trans-Mississippi Exposition, I believe. And on the front is a seven horse Schleicher, and the left side is a, is a, a 10 horsepower, and the right side is a two horsepower. So they were advertising their engines all over the country and, and promoting them wherever possible. And this was down in, down in uh, Louisiana. And there's a, another interesting photo. This came out of Louisiana State University. In the front, you got a uh, gasoline-fueled four horsepower Callahan. And in the back is a 10 horsepower Schleicher engine. And that's really the only good photograph of a 10 horsepower engine that I've seen. And I'm guessing the date of this to be probably around 1885, 1886. So that one with the bearing. What's that? The center hanger bearing and the side shaft. Does that one have it in there? Good question. Let's see. Doesn't like these big pictures. You know, I was wondering whether. Uh, you're talking. You're talking. Uh, Center there. Yeah, right there? Yeah. Yeah, it's there. Okay. So it's uh, it's of the same design. Is it yeah, typical but, for the spokes to be optional? No. No, there's been some uh, conversation about that. I, I was pretty particular about how they aligned things up. So being it was uh, at college, whether they had a failure or they bought a separate flywheel or it started out as a single flywheel engine, it's hard to say. Maybe they ordered a special flywheel after the fact and put a pulley on it for a dynamo. 
Um, but yeah, it's a good observation, and I, I'd say it didn't leave the factory that way, but something probably happened down the road. This is uh, the, the, the four horsepower engine that is in the annex of the Wilcox building came out of the Blake machine shop, which supported uh, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone business. This is the engine that was installed in exactly the same spot that preceded that engine. So if you see the four horse engine, you'll see there's a, a nice poster board behind it that shows a picture of the engine in the, in the Blake machine shop. That engine was put in here after this engine was installed. So we bought this two horsepower engine, put it in engine, but he was also a photographer, so he really documented the, uh, his, his business and, and what he was involved with quite well. But I found it interesting because in this photograph it actually shows an installed engine from that era, which are very hard to find with American engines. You can see the, the gas bag for the uh, ignition flame, the larger gas bag for the, the uh, uh, main incoming fuel, and, and just how they set it up it was that they pretty much just put it on a wood floor, belted it to a line shaft, and, and on the way they were. This is the exact same corner of the shop. Uh, a couple years later when they took out the two horsepower and they needed more power and put in a, uh, a four horsepower Schleicher engine. This, this photograph here is, is of the two horsepower Schleicher engine that's, that's in the Susan building currently. And this was the exhibit at the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago. And Henry Ford took this engine, which was one of his favorite, his favorite uh, uh, centerpieces in the, the museum out, brought it here for the, uh, the World's Fair, plumbed it up to run it. It was the centerpiece of, of the Ford exhibit in the World's Fair. So it's kind of neat from 1933, they knew it was special back.